Hi. So now we'll start lesson one in the Modern Harmony course. Our first lesson is going to relate to what in traditional harmony are called non-harmonic tones. That is to say, while the basic chords are moving around, the melody has more freedom and doesn't always rest only on no notes within the chords. In other words, those are notes that are not in the harmony, hence the name non-harmonic tones. Okay? We could also call those things linear dissonance if we want, which is really what we're going to be talking about here. So we're going to start from a lot of traditional dissonance formulas, but we're going to use them to move on into other less traditional formulas and to see how we can expand that idea. Just before we get into the details, one thing I have to make really clear, which is that this kind of harmony or this kind of dissonance, dissonant harmony, doesn't work unless the harmony is pretty simple. If I start using extremely complicated chords, there's going to be no way to feel which notes are part of the chord and which notes are not. If I have a three note chord like this, and I go, I can hear that some notes are part of the harmony and some are not. If I have this, what's in the harmony? Impossible to say. So again, this first technique we're talking about is really related to fairly simple chords, a fairly simple harmonic style. So it's more to do with the melody. It's important to review before we start the reason behind traditional dissonance formulas. Western music was originally vocal, and as vocal music, it necessarily emphasized what was easy to sing. Well, if somebody's playing a chord or singing a chord, and you want to sing a note within that chord, that's not very hard. I found my note. But if I'm not playing, I have to find the same note much harder. If I play the chord and I want to hit, let's say, that, much more difficult. So in other words, a note that isn't in the chord is always harder to sing than a note that is in the chord. Most of the traditional dissonance formulas are ways to get around that problem. They're ways to get you onto a note that isn't in the chord that are easy to sing. Of course, now we make music with instruments, not just with voices, but from the ear's point of view, the classical dissonance formulas are a very good way to make a note sounds like it belongs and it's not just a wrong note or an accident. Second thing is, it's really important in the texture that there be a distinction between the melody and the chords. That might be done with difference of register. It might be done with different tone colors. Say, the chords might be in the strings and the melody might be in the trumpet. But one way or another, there needs to be a distinction. Usually the melody is moving faster than the chords. It's not necessary, but it's usually much easier, and it tends to be what happens in the majority of cases. A third kind of linear dissonance really comes from the music of Bach. In Bach's music, you often have counterpoint, sometimes four or five part counterpoint, and it's possible with four or five parts to use two or three parts to make the harmony clear, and the other parts sometimes have dissonances at the same time. As long as the overall harmony stays clear, that doesn't pose a problem, and it does give us some very interesting harmonic possibilities that we wouldn't have otherwise. So, what are the basic principles governing the coherent use of dissonance? The principles are general in traditional harmony, and we're going to see how to extend them here. First principle is preparation. In other words, don't just attack a dissonance out of nowhere, prepare it. The best way to prepare it is with a common tone, like a suspension. Example 1A. We can see that in this example, the top note, instead of changing chords at the same time as the underneath note, instead of doing this, goes. So it holds over. That's a really easy way to make that a singable dissonance because I'm already holding the note, so I don't have anything new to do. Second way to prepare a dissonance is stepwise. For example, I could do something where I start off on an, a chord tone, then I have a dissonant note, and then another chord tone. But the important thing is they're all in a scale from one another. Example 1b. If I just went from one chord to the other one, I would have but here the note in between creates a kind of tension which gives the music an awful lot of interest which wasn't there before. We can extend that into what might be called 
an ornamental version of the same thing. If you look at example 1c, we can see that underneath it's really just just like 1b. The only difference is I have a little detour. Instead of going straight from this to this, I go... Notice that the detour note is in the same chord, so it doesn't create any need for resolution on its own. Let's listen to that again. 1c. The last and the most difficult way to prepare a dissonance is by leap. So the first note will be in the first chord, but instead of going stepwise to the next note, it's going to leap. Example 1D. So this and that are in the same chord, but from here to here, big leap. So that's harder than the other ones. Okay, now let's talk about the other side of the dissonance. We've talked about the preparation for it, how you get there. Now we want to talk about the resolution, how you leave it. And you can resolve a dissonance with varying degrees of tension. By definition, a dissonance is tense. It's in conflict with the chord. The easiest resolution is by step. Let's go back to example 1a. The D just goes down to the C sharp. Not very complicated. We could also go a step up. Example 1e. Pretty much the same thing, only direction is different. But the note is prepared and held over, and it resolves up by step. The third example gets more interesting. We can do what's called an ornamental resolution. Example 1F. We can see that this is really an ornamented version of 1E. It's really with stuck in between. Let's hear that again. Example 1F. This kind of ornamentation can take us quite far, as we will shortly see. Then, a rather less conventional kind of resolution, but it still has its place, and it can give some interesting effects when you need something a little more dramatic. We can resolve the note, but in the wrong voice. Let's look at example 1G. The first chord in example 1G is a dominant seventh chord. And we expect it to go there. Listen to 1G again, however. As you can hear, the dissonance is resolved, but in the bass instead of in the soprano. So that opens the door to some interesting possibilities. The dissonance doesn't always have to be resolved in the same voice. The only thing about this technique is you have to use it consistently. If everything else resolves in the same voice and one single example does not, it will just sound like a wrong note. If you use this technique regularly, it can give you lots of interesting harmonic colors. Okay, now a couple of other possibilities. Again, we're just beginning to go beyond the traditional possibilities here. One possibility is a dissonance can resolve to another dissonance. Look at example 1H. The note that seems to want to resolve is this one, and it seems to want to go there, but what I've done is I've changed the chord when it arrives, and the new chord is dissonant. This could also work pretty well, but it requires an overall rather more dissonant style. Finally, and perhaps most interesting, is example 1i, and 1i is special because it's an example taking farther the principle we saw in example 1F, delaying the resolution. Here's 1I. Now, if I take that apart, we'll discover that the first note in the melody belongs to the chord. Then there's an A flat, which does not belong to the chord, and an E, which does belong to it. Then I go to my second chord, the B belongs to the chord, but then there's a G. However, there's a G sharp underneath it. Where does that G come from? Well, actually, it comes from the A flat. I heard a few notes before. 
the G is dissonant and it goes down to F and that's dissonant too. So finally we get to the E, which is the resolution. Let's listen to the whole thing again. One I. This technique of resolving a dissonance later on can lead to very interesting things. This kind of ornamentation can become very, very elaborate. And as long as it stays within the listener's memory, then it will make perfect sense.